So this is basically uh, the most, uh, I would say, important imaging on the MRI. It's a sagittal imaging, how we call. Um, you saw multiple images uh, throughout this day, but here's the patient's face, here's the patient's back, the top of the head, and, and the spine, and we are looking from the side. And, and this is kind of a general, every single MR, uh, MR imaging that we do for any purpose, we have this image there. So uh, when we know that there is something going on from the history on the hypothalamic region, pituitary, we try to do some more specific, more detailed cuts through that area. So that's kind of what we get uh, with the more detailed imaging. And this is the, uh, the basic anatomy of that area. So here we have the thalami, and the hypothalamus are, is just below the thalami. So this is just a schematic view of the same picture. This is the MR. So we have the brain stem right here, the mammillary bodies that were talked a lot throughout the day today. Uh, we have the inferior portion of the hypothalamus that is called the tuber scenarium. In, uh, in radiology, for some reason, they love this location because that's where the hypothalamic hematomas are centered most of the time. Sometimes they just hang down from the tuber scenarium. Sometimes they involve the mammillary bodies, the third ventricle. This area here above the tuber scenarium is the third ventricle, and around the third ventricle is the hypothalamus. As we go down, we have the pituitary stalk that leads to the pituitary gland. Then we have, in the front here, we have the anterior pituitary, which you see as a dark uh, area, and this brighter area is the posterior pituitary, and they have different functions, functions uh, hormonal functions. And then, uh, just above the pituitary anteriorly here, you have the optic chiasm, which is the junction of the optic nerves that go, um, go into the orbits uh, and go back to the thalami for basically the vision. So, um, this is a very important structure as well that is very close to the hypothalamus. And that's basically this yellow outline is where the hypothalamus is. And this is the same picture, just in a, in a more schematic way. Um, and, and, and this is a schematic way of the hypothalamic hematoma. This is one of the pedunculated or that's just attached to the tuber scenarium region. And, and sticking down into the so supracellar system that we talk. So cella is the area where the pituitary is in, and everything that is above the cella we call supracellar. And you might have heard this term many times because the lesions in the hypothalamus, many times they, they uh, extend into the supracellar region. When we look at the different view, this is looking from front to back. Uh, we have the right side of the patient here. The left side here is the opposite that we see. This is just a... MR convention and how, how we do our imaging. So uh, this uh, hypothalamic region that we are outlined on the sagittal imaging, we have outlined in the coronal imaging as well. So here are the lateral ventricles. Here's the cerebral cortex. Sorry, cerebral cortex and hemispheres on both sides. Foramen of Monroe, Monroe in this region, third ventricle. And then as you go down, you see the mammillary bodies. You're just anterior to the mammillary bodies right here. But the hypothalamus is all this region surrounding the third ventricle and inferior the third ventricle. So many cases that we've seen today, some of them are hanging down from the inferior portion of the, from the mammillary bodies into the supracellar system, which is this area here. Or some of them are within the third ventricle or adjacent to the third ventricle laterally. And uh, taking, remembering that I, I, we don't have much on this imaging, but this is the internal carotid artery, so we have the right internal carotid here, the left on this side, and it's very close to the hypothalamus and supracellar system. And this is just a, a, a diagram of a coronal image, kind of the same as this one, just kind of focus more in the hypothalamus, the uh, lateral ventricles here, again, the third ventricle. And this is all the, the small nuclei of cells that are within the hypothalamus that have different functions and, and connect to different parts of the brain. Um, uh, so that's how it's, why it's so complex and uh, different <coughs> symptoms according to the location of the hypothalamic hematoma. Again, just outlining the hypothalamus there. So I think it was been talked a lot about today. Um, you know, what's the hypothalamus for? Controls the body temperature, pressure, appetite, also responsible for uh, behavioral, memory, emotions, 
and, and releases all hormones uh, and primary hormones that control the pituitary gland, which is right below the hypothalamus. And these hormones of the pituitary gland control many, many other um, endocrine issues within the body, including growth, thyroid, puberty, and, and some others. So pathology, this is not my area. This is a bunch, they don't just look like a bunch of cells to me. Uh, <laughs> but this is how a hypothalamic hematoma looks like from the pathology side after it's taken out. Um, and as it's been described, it's, it's, it's called a congenital malformation, which means that the patient was born with that um, and is not a true neoplasm. Um, it's usually composed of tissue elements that are normally found within the brain and they just grow disorganized. They have normal, small, large neurons, and they have astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, there are other types of, of cells within the brain that are also in the hypothalamic hematoma. And we have to remember that this happens very early in utero, so it's nothing that, uh, that you know, it's been done later on. Uh, this is really early in the gestational time that this develops. And as we discussed a lot today, the symptomatology, predominantly epilepsy, precocious puberty, and behavior and psychiatric issues. So imaging modalities, I will touch a little bit about computer tomography or CAT scan, but really not, that's not really uh, much used for hypothalamic hematoma. It's a very quick study, easy to do. I'm sure uh, many of you or your, your, your kids have gone through uh, does not require sedation. It takes about one minute, the entire study. Um, it's, it's usually done as an emergency exam. If the patient comes to the emergency room with a seizure, uh, with a known or unknown lesion, um, to try to, to find what's going on, something acute that can be treated right away. Uh, the issue with the, with, the, with the CT is that it has ionizing radiation, and uh, there's been studied more and more these days of the risks of the radiation in the developing brain. And obviously it's less detail in the hypothalamic region, so it's not really, uh, many times you can diagnose the hypothalamic hematoma, but it doesn't really give enough details to the clinicians or the surgeons uh, on what they need to work on and how do they need to approach it. So this is a, how a CAT scan looks like. Uh, here we have the brain stem, here we have the basilar artery carotid artery on both sides, and this is the supracellar system, that area that we were talking about, but this is a normal scan, there is nothing there. And this is a patient with a hypothalamic hematoma. Uh, here we see the brain stem, and we see this round lesion uh, extending to the supracellar system, and we can see very well that the carotid arteries are very close to the lesion, and that's uh, something crucial to know, but you really don't differentiate much uh, from, from, from the rest of the, the brain. It kind of looks like all the same. Um, this is a sagittal imaging, it's like the same as that MR, but on a CT, and you see that everything is more blurry or just more gray, everything the same gray. We have the supracellar region, but we don't see that nice as we saw on the MR. We see a little bit of the optic chiasm here, mammillary body. Uh, this is probably the basilar artery here, and this is that same patient with the hypothalamic hematoma. We have the brainstem, mammillary bodies, and you have this fairly large hypothalamic hematoma sitting in the supracellar cistern. But again, that's not all the information you need, uh, and usually we go ahead and do the MRI uh, to, 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 to look at better detail of the anatomy. So, but the MRI is, is not an easy study. Uh, it takes at least 40 minutes to an hour to be done. Many patients require sedation. I, I put here seven years. Uh, that's, uh, that's just a, a, a cutoff, but it, it really doesn't, uh, doesn't go well for all the patients. You have five-year-olds that will do great, and you have 12-year-olds uh, you know, that won't be able to do it. So uh, it's just an just a idea of age where the sedation is used for the most part. And what we do, actually, we have um, probably most of you have been through, but... Um, and it's something that really helps for young patients. Uh, we have goggles where the patients are actually wearing these goggles and watching movies throughout. And I would say that we cannot do these MRs six, seven-year-olds without them. There's no way you can keep a kid without watching a nice movie, some Minion or something <laughs> like that, uh, for an hour without moving. That's the most important part. <laughs> 
and uh, it shows excellent anatomy, like we've seen in many of the images. You can differentiate structures, you can differentiate the hypo hypothalamus and all the surrounding structures. It's really, really useful for surgical planning. Uh, but we have to remember, we need to use intravenous contrast. There's, there's many indications where we don't need necessarily intravenous contrast, but every time there is a lesion, we, we really like to use the contrast to differentiate specifically uh, in, in the hypothalamic hematoma setting, uh, differentiate from other lesions, and I'll show a few examples. But, but that's why we really like to use that. And as, as Dr. Curry showed, we use the MRI during stereotactic laser ablation um, during his procedure. Other studies, there is, uh, I don't know if anybody has uh, heard about MR spectroscopy. It's more uh, kind of research. Uh, we do some, but we don't really do much for hypothalamic hematoma. They've been trying, basically, it measures the metabolites within the brain and trying to differentiate through those metabolites uh, uh, which type of cells they come from and which type of cells are in the hematoma, and that could be helpful, but... Functional MRI, uh, we do a lot here for preoperative planning. Um, it's basically, it's, it, 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 the patient goes to the MR scanner and we give them some tasks to do and we get some imaging that will let you uh, kind of have an idea what side of the brain the language is and that kind of stuff and it will help uh, the pre-surgical planning as well. PET imaging, uh, we do a lot for the pre-surgical patients as well and uh, it's really, it's more uh, different than MRI, that is an anatomical um, study. The PET is more uh, looking for, for active areas within the brain. So uh, Dr. Curry is looking for the active areas within the hypothalamic hamartoma that could help him uh, to see the areas that he really needed to ablate more than others within the hamartoma. So this, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this, but the MRI is very complex, different than the CT that is just one set of images. Uh, the MR we call different sequences, so we have sequences called T2, T1, graded echo, diffusion, pre-contrast, post-contrast, and several other ones. And each of them we use for a specific reason. Uh, so many times I'm sure you guys have seen in, in, in MR reports these terms and different sequences. Uh, that we use. Again, this is an MR, this is a T1 imaging pre-contrast, the, the normal one that I show, and this is the pretty classic uh, hypothalamic hematoma extending from the inferior aspect of the hypothalamus into the supracellular cistern. So how does the hypothalamic hematoma look on the MR? It really many times looks similar to the adjacent brain, and it really depends on the size. But many times they have brighter signal uh, on the T2, uh, and, and that's depending on the type of cells that they have with it, within it. Uh, important to know, they should not enhance after we give IV contrast, and I'll show a few images. Very rarely they have cysts or calcification within it. Mo most of the time they are simple lesions uh, without any of those more complex uh, imaging appearance. And they should remain stable. They usually don't grow. They are that way, and they will stay that way unless treated. Uh, if they grow, we have to think about that they are dif something different and, and try to think outside the box. Uh, but this is a more... Uh, this is to show... This is the coronal imaging and the sagittal imaging we've seen before. Uh, the brain stem, these are the mammillary bodies that we cannot see here. It's basically... Uh, the, the hypothalamic hematoma is attached to the mammillary bodies, you can see, attached to the inferior hypothalamus uh, and extending to the supracellular system. But you see the signal here, that's what I'm trying to, to point here, is that see how bright it is. This is a T2 sequence. Uh, this is the white matter of the brain, and this is the gray matter of the brain in the periphery here. So many, many times it's really brighter than the rest of the brain. And does, Initially, in the beginning of the radiology studies, you'd, they would say that if it's brighter, it should not be a hematoma, but we know that that's not true, and most of the hematomas have some of this increased signal, so that doesn't uh, turn us away from the hypothalamic hematoma diagnosis. This is a post-contrast image. You can see, compared to this one, uh, you see some vessels that are uh, kind of bright. These are the venous sinuses. Uh, 
and, and they are bright, so that's how we know there is contrast. We see that the pituitary gland here is brighter. Uh, here the pituitary is dark, and so that's when we know there is contract. This pituitary is talk, also enhancing, but the, the hamartoma right there in the hypothalamus is not enhancing, and this is, this is the important characteristic of the hamartoma. Like I said before, there are other lesions in the, in the region of the hypothalamus, and these are some of the differential diagnosis for lesions. Uh, some, are this, some of these are benign or, or, or more aggressive tumors. Um, and I'll show. So this, this lesion here, we have the sagittal imaging, it's the T1 imaging, and we see again this lesion within the hypothalamus. This is the mammillary body here. You see the pituitary stalk. This is the optic chiasm. It, it looks like a hypothalamic hematoma to me, and I'm sure to you guys as well. However, when we give contrast, we see that this lights up uh, very much after contrast, and that's not, we know that this is not the characteristic of the hypothalamic hematoma, so we should be thinking about something else there. And this is a hypothalamic glioma. And, and in general, these patients uh, present with different symptoms than hypothalamic hematoma as well. So they usually do not have, uh, you know, gelastic seizures or precocious puberty. This is a different patient. This is an axial CAT scan. Uh, we see again here the brain stem. We see the basilar artery, and we see this lesion in the region called supracellar system, how we talk about. Uh, it's, it's kind of much darker than the rest of the brain, and there's some calcification around it. That's, that's very unusual for hypothalamic hematoma. And then when we look at the sagittal images, we see that the lesion actually extends into the cellar region uh, where the pituitary is, and, and from there it extends superiorly. And uh, we see the mammillary body here very well, but the rest of the, the structures are, are distorted. And this, so this was a craniopharyngioma, it's a different tumor. Uh, this was pre-localized to the cella and supracellar region, how we call, but they can be very large and they can extend posteriorly uh, very much into the region of mammillary bodies or, or even larger. And uh, this is the, the other patient. Again, we see an axial imaging. This is a T2 MRI. Um, and we have the brainstem here. We have the basilar artery, carotid artery on both sides. We have the optic nerves that are actually coming in into the orbits here. And we have this lesion that is sitting in the supracellar cistern as well. So it could easily be a hypothalamic hematoma. However, when you look at the remaining of the images, and this is actually a sagittal post-contrast imaging, we see that this lesion is, hard, is, is large, involves the, the, the cellar region where the pituitary is as well, and there's a lot of enhancement within the lesion. So we know this is not a hypothalamic hematoma for those reasons. And this was actually a germinoma, which is a germ cell tumor uh, that is treated completely different. Um, and uh, symptomatology usually is different as well. So classification of hypothalamic hematomas, I know a lot of people talk about today. From the radiology standpoint, we try to differentiate them in pedunculated and sessile. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those, but we let the type of classification that they want to use to the surgeons and neurologists uh, because they know which classification they want to use. So the pedunculated ones are usually attached to the hypothalamus the, or the tuber scenario by a thin stalk projecting into the supracellar cistern. And, and as been described before, they, they are more common associated with precocious puberty, especially when they are more anterior. This is an example of a very tiny uh, pedunculated lesion. We have here the pituitary, pituitary stalk, optic chiasm, mammillary bodies. So this is the region of the tuber scenarium. And we have this little lesion from a little thin stalk. As we can see on the chrono, this is a post-contrast imaging um, that we see does not enhance and extends below the hypothalamus there. Same thing on this image is the same. It's a coronal imaging, the same as, as this one here. Uh, very, very small, but this patient was symptomatic. Uh, this is another one that is probably pedunculated. Uh, we see the mammillary body very well. We see the... Uh, pituitary stalk, the optic chiasm, and we see this lesion just hanging below the level of the, uh, of the tuber scenario into the supracellar cistern. And then the sessile types, uh, it's the mass that is within the hypothalamus attached to the mammillary bodies. It's usually more symptomatic and more often they have seizures, how it's been the, this, discussed this morning. 
So this, this is an example of a sessile lesion. We see again, this is the corona. It's the same case I think I showed before. The coronal T2 imaging with the lesion attached to the hypothalamus. You really don't see a, a plane here between the hypothalamus and the lesion. We don't see well the mammillary bodies because the, the, the lesion is basically involving the mammillary bodies. Uh, this is a different patient. Again, you have the mammillary bodies that you cannot see. You have the optic chiasma. And, and this lesion is actually going under uh, the region of the hypothalamus into the supracellular system, but it's also going above, going into the third ventricle uh, and below the third ventricle. That's how lateral ventricle is third ventricle here. Just remembering the anatomy with the mammillary bodies, we don't see the region of the tuber scenario. We don't see here either. So that's where the, the lesion is centered. Classification, as I said, several classification systems. This is the classification system that is more used in the radiology literature, but I really don't want you guys to know because it seems like the neurologists and neurosurgeons use a different one. Um, so keep away from that. Uh, this is uh, a small baby with a three-month-old with seizures. And we can see this is the sagittal T1 pre-contrast, T1 post-contrast. We see the optic chiasm here. We see this large or, or, or reasonably um, hypothalamic hematoma does not enhance after contrast. We see the pituitary here very separate from this lesion. And then the, the coronal T2 imaging, we see again there is some bright uh, within the lesion. And uh, the reason this, this, this brightness within the lesion is kind of similar to the rest of the brain on this baby. And the reason the brain looks like that, a little bit different from the other patients, different from this one, is because it's a baby. So uh, there's not a lot of myelination. There's not a lot of myelin in the brain yet. So that's why it looks brighter than, than the older patients. And this baby went, uh, went to surgery uh, a while ago, and this was the residual lesion after surgery. We see the optic chiasm here and the lesion just below it, just below the region of the mammillary bodies. Um, another patient, patients with seizure, um, same thing, lesion attached to the mammillary body, the tuber scenarium. The rest is, is pretty intact. Very similar characteristic on the T2, very bright. We see that this rest of this brain is darker. It's an older patient, uh, but very attached to the hypothalamus, predominantly on the right side. So I have a couple examples of large lesions. Um, and this patient was a two-year-old. Like they discussed before, probably the larger the lesion, the more combined symptoms they will have of seizures and precocious puberty. So this kid have, had a very large lesion. We see, uh, and this has actually a cystic component within it. Um, uh, this is a post-contrast image. We see that the vessels uh, of the brain are not are enhancing. We see that the pituitary is enhancing, but you really lose the anatomy of the hypothalamus. It's all being filled by this lesion. And um, the anterior, the pituitary stalk is actually displaced anteriorly by the lesion. And uh, this patient first underwent uh, subtotal resection somewhere else, and, and this was the residual lesion, attached, still attached to the right aspect of the hypothalamus, third ventricle, lateral ventricles, hypothalamus, hypothalamus, and it's attached to the right side. So Dr. Curry actually, actually did ablation on this patient, and this is the image that we obtain after the ablation um, while he's still in the scanner. So here we see the probe going to the residual uh, hamartoma, and, and there's a little bit of enhancement around it, and that's pretty common to see after the ablation. This is another patient that had this very large lesion. Again, we see that the brain stem here, it's, it's a little bit distorted. Uh, this is the midbrain, here, the midbrain, and it's kind of pushed superiorly in mammillary bodies. You can't really see them. Uh, the lesion goes very low and very high into the third ventricle as well. We see the pituitary is separate, so this was a hypothalamic hematoma. And, and Dr. Curry also did a laser ablation. I think he did more than one on this patient, given the size of the lesion. And this is the, the probe going to the lesion. 
A couple of smaller but different types. Uh, this patient had both gelastic seizures and precocious puberty. Uh, again, that same coronal imaging of the brain. We have the third ventricle hypothalamus, and we have this, re this lesion that is hanging along the right side of the hypothalamus, extending into the third ventricle. Uh, this is the sagittal imaging, how we see, very similar to all the others involving the mammillary bodies and the, and the inferior hypothalamus. Again, this is uh, before and during the laser ablation where the probe is right within the lesion and, and the thermal ablation will be done right at that location. This is a similar lesion, uh, except on the, on the other side. Again, coronal T2, third ventricle here, supracellar cistern right here. And we have this lesion on the left aspect of the hypothalamus uh, extending into the third ventricle. This is before and after laser ablation. It was, uh, there was still a little residual, but uh, it, was, it was smaller. And, and like Dr. Curry said, not always after the laser ablation you get a total uh, 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 the, the lesion doesn't disappear completely and it's more related to whatever disconnection you have and especially in the larger lesions there's no way you're going to get them completely after one ablation so I think uh, the part that the MRI is very exciting is that you know the amount of information you can get and you can give to the clinicians and to the surgeons about all where the lesion is and all the adjacent structures like everybody, a lot of people talk about how important these structures is, are and how uh, the treatment uh, has to be done to try to minimize the morbidity of injury of all these structures. And here we have the lesion again, the carotid and basilar arteries, which are the main arteries that bring blood to your brain, are right around these lesions. So uh, this is very, very important. So these are the the, the things that we talk about today, and just summarizing, um, we use CT most of the time in the setting, emergency setting for seizures or, or preoperative setting, like Dr. Curry mentioned, uh, when he, he's doing this, the laser procedure, they, he, do, he does uh, a CT, very thin cuts to localize and to try to, to be able to, to get to the right place with his cannula with those images. And the MR is, is, is still the main uh, imaging modality that is used at this time for diagnosis, anatomy, and surgical planning. We have to keep in mind that we need to use the appropriate protocol, the appropriate imaging if you have, uh, uh, and I think we are getting much better. We have, you know, 1.5 Tesla, three, three Tesla scanners, and, and, and the advantage of the three Tesla, one gives a little bit more detailed imaging, but better. It gives you thinner cuts, it gives you less timing, and, and you can get that with the same time that you, or, or quicker than you would do with a, with a regular scanner. And uh, as I said before, we need to use contrast to exclude other lesions. Uh, and just remind that the hypothalamic hematoma should not enhance and should not grow. If there is any of those, you should think about something else. Uh, location related to the adjacent important structures, that's a major uh, uh, quality of the imaging. And, and then there is new techniques and development progression of the imaging techniques that we have uh, that I think are going to bring uh, much, much more information in the near future. So thank you.